So, because there were some people who had planned to be here, including my mom, I'll get to that in a minute, and so I was like, hey, I do this for a living. I'll just set up a Zoom link for this. All right, good morning. Um, on behalf of New Covenant Church and Michaela and myself and all the ladies who so lovingly prepared this for you this morning, I'm going to have to be really still, that's going to be really hard. Um, we're so glad you're here, and our hope and our prayer for our morning together is that no matter your season, this is going to be hard, your circumstance, that over the next few hours you would experience the hope and the comfort and the peace and the celebration of your season that is only available through Christ, our Savior. I also want to share with you who are guests with us today. Um, I'm actually pretty new to New Covenant myself. We moved from Atlanta to Anderson in June of 2021. And the fellowship and the community and the love and the gospel and the kindness is actually real. Um, I've been to a lot of churches in my day. And what is here in New Covenant is like no other. So if you do not have a church home, or maybe you don't like the church home, uh, we would love for you to be here with us. So it truly does feel like home. And I would love, we would all love to help you feel connected if you have been here for a while and maybe you don't yet. There's a lot of places to experience um, gospel community. So in real life, I am a wife and I'm a mom of five. I am a life coach and I am a, wait, Christian life coach, and I am also a business coach for Christian life coaches. I am an adopted mom as well, and that is such a part of our journey as a family and of seasons that I'm not actually going to share today. If they invite me back one day, that'll be another topic. Um, but my specific prayer for each of you is that through the experiences of my journey that I will share with you um, with discontent, suffering, depression, debilitating anxiety, that in light of the gospel, you would be encouraged as well. I also pray that each of us here would have a deeper hope. This is really hard because I can't turn. I'm sorry. Because I can't turn like this. And I can't turn like this. All right. Um, that you would walk away with a renewed hope and belief that he truly has the ability and the power to do more than we could ever ask or imagine right in the very season we're in, right in the very lives that we're in, the ones that he's given, actually. Um, circumstances and situations past, present, and future make up the lives that God has for each of us. So, what a gift it is to be here with you today. Last time I spoke, I spoke in June at an event, and I was holding my mic, which might actually be better at this point. Um, my papers were going everywhere, like literally across the stage. I'm picking up my papers. I'm like, oh my goodness. So I have my notes on my computer. So I am sliding because I just am going to admit right now, I don't have the bandwidth with all these children to memorize anything. So uh, we're just going to do it that way. <laughs> um, but it is a gift to be here with you today. Um, you probably don't know that this event today fell in one of my busier seasons. I actually had registered to attend. And, and then Michaela's like, by the way, could you be the main speaker? Um, so it's been a busier season than I can remember in quite some time. Additionally, hold on, let me see if Gobo has made her way to the Zoom. She has not. Okay. Um, additionally, my 79-year-old father was hospitalized and tried to keep it a secret this past weekend um, in Florida. But I told him he was going to have to hold off on any strokes and heart attacks until October 20th. So we settled for a bad case of vertigo <laughs> instead. But I'm really grateful for each of you who took the time this week to take my kids to volleyball and feed my family and give me a little bit of extra time and support through prayer. And so let's get started. Is this bothering y'all? Okay. If it does, just let me know. Um, so seasons. Our seasons are all very similar in this one thing. And that is that God has orchestrated every facet of our lives for his glory, that we might depend on his provision for our every need, be it physical, emotional, spiritual, mental, financial, any other goal we want to have. Um, and the truth of the matter is, is that even in our um, exciting seasons, 
graduations and pregnancies and births and weddings and celebrations of all sort can still bring about their own sets of challenges and stresses. I learned this when my husband and I, we were dating, engaged, and married in four months. We thought we would like spare myself the stress by going away to get married. And then we had a 600 person reception. And I wrote thank you notes for I don't know how long. We had 14 wedding showers. My in-laws knew a lot of people in the Atlanta area and they all came to these showers. And I was, I didn't know that your body and your brain and your heart, like you still experience a lot of stress even in exciting times. And sometimes we don't know the difference. And so all of our seasons will bring a deeper dependence on him as we face less than normal circumstances in our lives, aging parents, chronic illness, loss of loved ones, marital hardships, terminal health diagnosis, financial struggles, infertility, miscarriage, and just any added stress due to what that entails as well, whether you're traveling to care for people, if you're planning more additional things than you have, organizing details, appointments, thank you notes, or in our case, five evenings of ball games per week. So whether we're walking through these seasons of excitement and anticipation alongside God's provisions and answers to our prayers, or whether we're walking through seasons of suffering and the things that we actually did not pray for, we can rejoice in this one truth, and that is that it has all been created by him, and he does hold it together as well as us. So Colossians 1, 15 through 17 says that he is the invisible, no, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things hold together. I had to make sure I was recording. I'm really giving you uh, some anticipation there. Miss Aubrey's traveling now, she's listening. Let her in. Okay, so if everything was in fact created by him, and if our seasons were created by him, then what does it actually look like as Christian women to continue in the faith, steadfast and stable, not shifting from the hope we have in the gospel, and enduring our seasons with great hope and patience. Because the truth is, our seasons were created not only through him, but to him. Even when it doesn't feel like it, and like the season isn't going to end, or the details will never get figured out, or that if we actually survive until bedtime, the truth is that it's only in him will any of this, or any of us, be held together. So as I mentioned a moment ago, the invitation and the gift to share this morning, a story that I didn't write, by the way, uh, might possibly be the worst timing if I had been the creator of the timing. As I mentioned, I'm a, a life and business coach, so I'm actually hosting my clients um, in a four-day event. So I'm literally like preparing, I think I counted up, it's like 20 hours of this type of content. And I'm like, whew, I didn't know I had that many thoughts in my brain, but I guess I do. So um, anyway, but it has been such a gift that the Lord has allowed me to put aside all of my plans and my ambitions and to prepare and share these gifts and tools that are not mine because he has given them to me. Most of which came <clears throat> from some very hard and long and painful seasons of anxiety and depression, discontent, anger, frustration, kids in and out of hospitals, uh, miscarriage, infertility, our adoption, the passing away of my father-in-law, and so much abundant life in between those seasons. And so as I share some of these with you today, I do want to allow you, or I want you to allow yourself to do a few things. A lot of times, we like to think that our special story, and our special hurt, and our special season, and our special circumstance, that nobody understands it. And if they did, then they would treat us differently, they would show up differently, and that's not the case to be found because I'm fully convinced if we put all of our complaints and all of our heart and all of our hurt in like a bucket and we reached in to get somebody else's, we would actually put that one back. 
And the reason is because in the midst of all of our trials that the Lord has uniquely created for us, on the other side of that is the abundant life that he has given to each of us in our own families, in our own walks, in our own lives. And so we don't get to pick the parts that we keep, and we don't get to pick the parts that we give back as much as we want to sometimes, because I tried. <laughs> I was the best at comparing what this husband did and what this husband didn't do, and what this wife had, and what this wife didn't have. I call it the compare and despair. And the Bible calls it envy, and jealousy, and covetousness, covetousness, and sin. And that causes us to question our Creator, the one who has given, and the one who has not given to us. Isaiah 45, 9 says, Woe to the one who quarrels with his Maker, an earthenware vessel among the vessels of earth. Will the clay say to the potter, what are you doing? Or the thing you are making say, he has no hands. So see, our lives are not our own. And this world is not our home. And he is still the potter, and we are still the clay. The second thing... I was doing fine, and now I'm kind of starting to shake. Uh, the second thing that I would love for each of us to remember as I share these stories is to remember. Remember the ways that the Lord has answered each of your prayers, provided, been near in trial and in hardship. Praise him and thank him for that faithfulness. And if you're currently not doing so, allow yourself to trust him to do it again. And thirdly, if you are someone who the Lord has so uniquely created and gifted to feel more joy than pain, more hope than hopelessness, more peace than anxiousness, like if you're the person who just wakes up rejoicing in the day that the Lord has made, uh, please continue to encourage and pray for us because some of us need a lot of coffee and need their children not to talk to them in the mornings. And like I told my kids the other day, I need seven hours of quiet in the morning and seven hours of quiet in the afternoon. Like that's just like how God kind of created me, which makes life a little hard. So those of you who don't live that way, I actually had a very best friend of mine. And I'm going to get into the juicy stuff of what it looks like to not be a Christian in the Atlanta area as a teen and what you do. Um, she was rose tinted glasses. She has since come to know the Lord as well. And rose tinted glasses thinks that you can drive in any condition so even when i wasn't a christian i was still like the one that was kind of like in control and in charge so one night she just like thinks it's so funny and she kind of runs us off the road and so that can serve us very well to be so chipper and like have no problems in life until it doesn't so i say all that to say for those of you who are naturally that way and you kind of don't relate to those of us who struggle we love you and we are so thankful for you, and we need you in our lives. So thank you for being here. All right, so here we are, each of us, in a season created uniquely for us by our Creator. The seasons that have us right here, right now, where we are in this moment. Seasons past. Hold on a second. I feel like we should have done a challenge, just like put like an M&M in &M a container every time I said seasons, and do like a giveaway. <laughs> right? Okay, anyway. I just thought about that. Okay, so seasons past and seasons present. Seasons he has for us that we have no idea about. Remembering and rejoicing over his faithfulness. The ways that he's provided and carried and sanctified us. But what does it look like in the here and now? In the waiting, in the aging, in the empty nesting, in the teething and the potty training, in the sickness and the suffering, in the overwhelm, and in the anxiousness day to day. What do we do when what we know to be true in the gospel, like capital T, true, isn't changing how we feel about our circumstance? And it's hard, and we want to give up. Like I said, I'm living proof that he can do exceedingly above all we can ask or imagine when our hope is gone, when there's no end in sight, when if people knew the pain behind our smiles, and us showing ups, or the truth of what we were thinking about the life God had given us, or the season he had given us, then we would be exposed and rejected and cast out. 
less than and unworthy. This is the part where I might cry. So in September of 1997, uh, the Lord himself reached down and redeemed my life. I thought I'd get a little further. And my soul from the pit of hell and destruction. Right on my bedroom floor at my parents' home. I was 19 years old. I'm 44 now. I had drunk and smoked and drugged and abusive guide my way into a world where I believed God was definitely not real. And if he were, there would be no way that he could redeem or forgive a story like mine. Because surely I was too far gone. But the truth is, is that he saves his elect. And we're never too far gone. And he comes for his children, the ones he's called his own. And as it turns out, he doesn't stop. He keeps coming for us. He comes for us in our despair, our heartache, our hurt, our confusion, our anger, our frustration. And as it turns out, our debilitating depression and anxiety as a Christian. He comes for our marriages and he comes for our parenting. So like any good Pentecostal on that night in September of 1997, when God made himself real to me through my pink Precious Moments Bible on my knees with that navy blue carpet, I think it was the trend of 94, I assumed I could just name it and claim it and as a Christian bound for eternity, life was going to be easy now, right? Because Christians were happy people. And for Christians, things go our way. And because we pray, sadness doesn't exist as Christians. Because Christians would be like Jesus, perfectly whole. Except I wasn't. Because that's not the truth of the gospel. We aren't perfectly whole on this side of heaven. So I want to paint the picture of that night. I literally just told my mom this story about two years ago. She's with us today on Zoom. Um, My parents were out of town. We had been partying all day partying all night and by we I mean a house full of my friends ladies young ladies your friends are the ones that point you to Jesus okay so around a nine o'clock p.m. I found myself in a state of panic and fear which I now know was just the Holy Spirit using my pain and my emptiness and my loneliness to draw me to him and that he did so I left the party the one I was hosting and I went upstairs And I cried out, and I was like, if you are real, then reveal yourself to me. And so I opened that pink Bible to Isaiah 40, verses 30 and 31, and it goes like this. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. And what the Lord showed me was that the sin of my youth was going to be forgotten. And I would be washed white as snow. And the thoughts and the memories and the things I had disbelieved for so long would only be renewed by biblical truth over and over and over again. And so I surrendered my life that night on my knees with my hands raised to heaven. And he's been bringing me back to my knees in surrender ever since because rarely do things go my way and so what happens next and this story is almost over is i go downstairs and i'm like tear-faced and i say y'all this party's over and i just became a christian and i'm going to live a different life and it doesn't include any of this and they all kind of sort of laughed and like literally thought it was some hallucination and that was valid and i was very sober So the party left, and I got up in my bed all by myself for the first time in a long time because I never wanted to be alone. And I stayed up all night reading the words in that pink Bible, and praying and journaling and falling in love with the God of the universe. So we'll fast forward. I'm going to save the next 15 years for another time. Filled in with those are a lot of years of sanctification and joy and disappointment and sadness and excitement. And prayers answered and prayers not. And marriage and hurts and miscarriage and infertility and people dying at 16 suddenly, sickness, suffering, almost losing our son Kemp, almost losing me. 
God did not promise us an easy road. He promised us that he would be with us on that road. And even when we don't feel like it's true, it actually is still true. He promised that our circumstances were created just for us and that he has not made a mistake with any of it. Because in Ephesians 1.11, he says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things, according to the counsel of his will. So fast forward to July of 2012. Kemp, at the time, we had not adopted our um, youngest yet. He was two months old. We had been home and out of the NICU for about six weeks. My oldest, Annalie, was five. Emmeline was four. Claren was 20 months, and it was two o'clock in the morning, and we awoke to smoke and fire alarms. And since I'm not the person who wakes up at any time like, Whoa, this is the day the Lord has made, I was, why, why did you change the batteries? Why are these things going off? What, why are we, why, what's going on? So we walk around the house, and like, there's no smoke, there's nothing going on, so I'm still like, like complaining and asking why we, these are going off at 2 o'clock in the morning because if we had done that earlier, that wouldn't be happening. The kids would not wake up. And I was like, wait, I think I smell something. And so, so I said, I was like, look in the basement. I was like, open the basement door. We at the time had um, someone living with us. She was in graduate school. She had been living with us for about four years, um, part of our family. And so... Bray went to open that door just to see, like, where is this electrical fire smell coming from? And smoke engulfed our entire home in about 2.2 seconds. So he ran to the basement to check on her and get her out of the house. And I had a two-month-old and 20-month, well, no, what I did first was I got the older girls, five and four, out onto the porch. We had two chairs. I sat them down. I was trying to be, like, super calm in the moment. I'm actually pretty calm in moments. It's later on where, like, things really start to fall apart. So I'm like, oh, listen, we're going to do something. I need y'all to come to be big girls. I need you to sit outside in this chair. You get to hold brother. And you get to hold sister. So I put them on their chairs, and they're like, this. They needed coffee, too. And then I went and got one of them, and I went and got, no, I think I got them both at the same time. I like, you know, you can do that as moms. You can, like, strategically envision this nightmare happening, and you follow through with it. So I had them one. I was doing it. It was a nightmare. Okay, literally and figuratively. And this moment was the catalyst for what we call the breakdown of 2012. So the girl that had been living in our basement, she had lived with us for four years. She was a part of the girl's lives, my life, a part of our family. And on that night in July, she relapsed from an alcohol addiction and an eating disorder. She took some pills, she took some shots of vodka, and she started boiling chicken to get the fat of it, fat out of it so that she could force herself to eat it. We had to move out of the house when they did the renovations. I don't know if you know much about what's called a protein fiber, but protein fires, re fires release fibers into every fiber of your home. Every sock, every tablecloth, every anything that had a fiber was removed from the home and cleaned. Oh, and get this. Not only did that happen, everything was returned with a safety pin on it, with like a little cleaner's tag. So not only was I like barely functioning, now I'm removing, I, mean, I would say tens of thousands of safety pins from items. So I was, I was really not content in that situation. Um, we did have to make one of the most difficult decisions we've made in our marriage, which was to not allow her to live in our home anymore. And we did so by seeking a lot of wise counsel, a lot of tears, potentially some cuss words. But fast forward a few months later, then that situation, we're back in our home for about two weeks. And it's Thursday, September the 13th. And we got a call that my 16 year old cousin had collapsed at basketball practice. They worked on him for 45 minutes to get his heart working again. And two days later, they confirmed there was no brain activity. So my parents took the red eye home from a trip. And on September 15th, after 48 hours of harvesting his organs, we stood in the hallway and we watched as they wheeled him away and took what they could and gave life to another through his organs. And then we buried him. And I held his mom in my arms and I watched her never be the same. And that was 10 years ago. A few months after all of this, all of my 
personal strength was gone. I had no feelings, and I had no choice but to be honest. Because my life, while every prayer had been answered, some had, a husband had loved me and served me so well, I had four healthy children, I was miserable and a Christian. I was overwhelmed, I was anxious, I was depressed. Depressed. Life was exhausting and frustrating, it was unenjoyable, and it was irritating. But no one knew that because of how strong I was until I wasn't. And so I found myself at a doctor appointment, unsure. Now all I wanted to do since I was like nine years old was be a mom. And I was at this doctor's appointment and I was like, I don't think I know how to change a diaper. I had changed like millions of diapers in my life. And I was shaking and I was nursing and I was paranoid that they were going to notice how bad I actually was and that they were going to take my baby right there. And so I had to admit to everyone around me that the strong one could not be strong anymore. And I had to ask for help. So I left the doctor's office and I pulled over in a Publix parking lot. We had those there. And I called my husband and I said, here is how bad I am. And there are some things that I haven't been telling anyone because I've been holding it together. But here's what I need. I called my mom and my mother-in-law and my sister-in-law, and probably my aunt and my cousin, and a few friends. Overshare alert right here. Is anybody overshare? I'm like, oh, let me tell you everything. <laughs> and I said, some things are really bad with me, and I need help. So I started counseling three times a week. We canceled every single thing on my calendar. I had a paper calendar at that time. I kept it in pencil, because like every good calendar manager writes it in pencil. And I just erased everything. I missed friends' weddings, friends' milestone birthdays, baby showers, wedding parties, baby showers, bachelorette things. Everything I was invited to, I said no. And saying no felt like the worst Christian ever. And I did not do anything beyond caring for my family and myself. I had tried to be all things to all people. And the standards that I had set for myself as a Christian and a mom and a wife were unattainable. As we later came to realize, I had actually been clinically depressed for some time and extremely anxious. Had no idea, because I was still so happy and smiling. And um, when you couple that with the events I just mentioned, and you add, add traumatic loss in any difficult season or circumstance on an already overwhelmed life, you completely shut down. I wasn't afraid of anger or anxiousness or overwhelm at this point. I was afraid that I felt nothing. So over the next few months, I slowly healed. My body and my mind recovered, and I was functioning a little better than before. But four kids, five and under, is in general not like a slow walk in the park on a fall day with a pumpkin spice latte. <laughs> it's up and down and discipline and sippy cup and snacks and buckling in and diapers and being up in the night and all the things. But what's interesting that I want you to hear as I share this mental and emotional state that I was in, I was spending about two hours a day in the Word, journaling, praying. That's like my favorite place to be. And I don't say that from a place of holiness. I'm like just saying that that's just like, ooh, I would rather do this than, but I love y'all. <laughs> um, leaning into the Holy Spirit going to Bible study. There was nothing more I loved in life than Jesus. A little coffee and watching volleyball is a close second. But when you've seen what I've seen and when you've been saved the way he saved me, there is no hope or no comfort but him. My husband actually says, he's like, I'm kind of sometimes jealous of the Lord because like, y'all are like this. I'm like, no. Oh. So in my human nature though, I could not will myself to not be overcome by my circumstances in life even at the best of times. The very circumstances that I had prayed for. Now, I don't want to give the wrong impression here, but my conversations and my thoughts were also still very much full of truth. I fully believed that he had created me for that time and that season and that it was all from him. I did believe that I could be content in my circumstances, but I didn't feel it. I didn't know how to stop being anxious or depressed or overwhelmed no matter how much time I spent reading scripture, praying, memorizing truth, and surrounding myself with other believers. So I asked the potter, what is wrong with me? Why can I not be like a better Christian? And so a pastor reminded me once 
And it gave me such hope in the darkest of nights of feeling like a failure and feeling inadequate. And that is this, that a God who is big enough for our sin is also big enough for what we're going through. It's stated right here in Romans 8.32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Now I want to read a little more in this chapter, because no offense, but we can sometimes act like a bunch of preschoolers when it comes to what's going on in our lives. Stomping, raising our fist. That's not what I want. Because we only want sometimes the good that comes with our salvation and not the brokenness that we experience in our lives because of the fall and because of sin or just the stress of everyday life and circumstances. In verse 18, Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility. Now listen, I have a master's degree in education and I'm a former teacher. I didn't know what futility meant. Does anybody know? Like, do you just know off the top of your head? Are y'all that smart? Of course you are. Well, for those of you who are not quite as smart as some of us in the room, futility stands for pointlessness or uselessness, right? Like this season of mine has no point and it's useless. Not willingly, but because of him, I just had a spit bubble, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemptions of our bodies. Redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. And now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, this is my favorite part, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Our seasons highlight our weaknesses, don't they? And we women folk don't like feeling weak. But he did, who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is, him who, it is God who justifies. Who is he to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? For as it, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Here comes the next best part. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So when we think about our specific season and we list all the grief and the pain and the aggravation and even the, we're going to have one more school meeting in the first seven weeks of school, or one more place I have to drop someone off, or the, oh my gosh, one more doctor appointment, and another sickness, and another husband who did not blow the leaves off the deck when we asked, and when he said he would, whatever it is, none of it 
separates us from the love of God. And so how do we take these verses and the truth of Scripture like this one? Ephesians 3, 16 through 20. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend what all the sa- with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all fullness, all the fullness of God. How do we not feel separated from God's love when we're walking through the season that feels so alone, that brings such discontent? When we ache and we yearn and we want more or we want less of what we have, we want what we haven't been given or we want what was given and was taken away. How do we forgive, move on, consider others before ourselves and be like Christ? content in our circumstances. And then there's this part. While considering it all joy, while being anxious for nothing, and also trying to keep toilet paper in the bathrooms? Well, many ways we do this, obviously, because the Bible is full of all the answers that we need. But the way we're going to touch on here, I timed it. I'm trying to hurry. I was like 36 minutes. What's happened? I guess I was talking faster. But anyway, are y'all okay? Okay, so what we're going to touch on here, and actually there's not that much longer, but um, is the truth we have in Romans 12, 1 through 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your personal worship. Now, pause. I personally, and maybe like some of you, in the same way I don't just like wake up rejoicing in the day the Lord has made, I don't immediately go to being like a living sacrifice or spiritual worship when the dog just peed on the floor or when somebody hurts one of my kiddos or when my husband's late to pick up a child after I arranged his whole life in the calendar and called him an hour before the pickup. Anyway, um, or when you become the sole caretaker of a parent. And so then you are managing your household and another or a medically challenged parent, or a medically challenged self, or the loss of said parent? Or what about when a friend isn't being a friend? Or everyone's going somewhere and you're not invited? Or your parents just tell you you can't go? See, when your heart and your mind and your hands of acceptance and surrender don't happen automatically to the God of the universe, we must take that passage of scripture just a little bit further by taking our thoughts captive, by choice, and by habit. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. See, the biggest way to change how you feel in your season or your circumstance and how to respond to our less-than-wanted hurts and envies and jealousies and sin is to be transformed by renewing our minds. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take thought every captive to obey Christ. Take every thought captive to obey Christ. My prayer of salvation at 19 did not transport me into a Christian life that like I thought where I would not have hurt or pain or disappointment or confusion or anxiousness or depression or brokenness. It took walking out salvation with great fear and trembling, daily commitment to reading God's word, prayer, serving others, and being transformed by the renewing of my mind. Because as Proverbs 23, 7 tells us, for as he thinks within himself, so he is. What we think matters. If we don't want to be conformed to this world of Christian women riddled with anxieties and depressions and resentments and frustrations and discontents and complaints and suffering unto our glory, i.e. pity party, table for one, then we must walk in a new mind. 
So in this little breakout session that we have, um, I'll be sharing some more tangible and practical ways that we do this as believers. But generally speaking, when we think about creation, God laid it out in Scripture in Genesis. And we as believers, we create too. We see it in children before they can speak, with toys as they create. We grow up and we create homes and lives and jobs and art and all the things according to his will and call on each of our unique lives. And guess what creates these things? Our thoughts, our creativity, what's in our minds and what he calls us to. And so our thoughts will also create how we feel and walk through our seasons and act in our seasons. That's actually how, what's going to determine the season we're in. God transforms and renews our minds. Yes, when we become Christians, and of course when we spend time with him and meditate on his word day and night, but he also does this as it relates to suffering and anxiety and depression and overwhelm and waiting. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think, according to the power at work within us. He can do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And it can happen through surrender to his plans and gratitude each and every day over the things we cannot change. I actually come from a long line of addicts. And do you know what addiction shows up like when you're not abusing a substance? Anxiety and depression. And so I've watched many a family member become sober, become Christians, live different lives. I've watched some not. I've watched them succumb to the diseases. And so in my own recovery from anxiety and depression, included this saying over and over to myself, um, and it's, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace. Taking, as Jesus did, this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right as I surrender to your will, so that I may be, I love this word, reasonably happy. Nobody said anything about being happy. Reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. So, in summary, our circumstances and our seasons are from him. They're created by him and to him. That we might experience a comfort and a peace and an understanding and a love that we might not have ever known. Our seasons, seasons of aging and waiting and suffering and overwhelm or anxiousness, they're from him and they're to him. And it's through him, it's the only way we navigate it. And it's such a gift. It may not be the gift we would choose, but in the end, may it be a gift we wouldn't give back. May it actually be a gift that we re-give to others by way of ministry and encouragement and hope for the building up of one another. That we might all look back, as I have done today, I'm not the only one with stories here, we all have them, and be used and use the story that he writes with others around us through our seasons to share.